Yeah, so, so we, we organize it, and so Brother Neil Anderson will bring the word to um, Olivia and Keenan, his two kids, they with him this morning. And um, yeah, he's, he's just a wonderful brother. He loves the Lord. Um, a wonderful testimony of faithfulness and the Lord's strength in keeping him. So brother, come, bless, bless us with the word, encourage us, and it's wonderful to have you here. Thanks, brother. Well, I just greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, and uh, it's a wonderful blessing to come and worship with you this morning. Um, let's jump into the Word of God. The title of the message is Rebellion, and you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. We're going to look at Jude, verse 11. Verse 11. So, the topic of the sermon today is rebellion against spiritual authority. So, spiritual authority would be people that God has appointed uh, to lead His people. So, primarily we're thinking of elders, pastors, overseers in the church, in the local church. It's a very interesting verse. Let's just read it together. Jude 11. He says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the era of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So those are very strong words. And uh, I just need to explain some of the context so you can understand exactly what this man of God is saying in this letter that he writes here. So the author is Jude. That's his name. We read about it in verse 1. And he's writing about certain people. He says, woe to them. The question is, who are the them? Well, the them are a group of people I like to call Christian pretenders. Christian pretenders. They are pretending to be Christians. They are not real Christians. They do not have faith in Jesus Christ. But they go to church. And they like to dictate what happens at church. And they like to tell people how to live. And they like to tell pastors what to do. They are very opinionated. And they profess to follow Christ, but they clearly do not. Just have a look at verse 4. This is a graphic description of these people. And they were in all the churches that Jude was writing to. Listen to what he says. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about people in the church and you notice a few things in this verse. One is that they were covert. They didn't come in and announce that they didn't actually believe the Bible. It says that they even crept in unnoticed. They, uh, people have not discerned that these are actually ungodly persons. That's what he calls them, ungodly persons. They don't know God. They haven't experienced the grace of God in salvation. And what do they actually do? He says here, yeah, they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. In other words, they take this wonderful truth of God's grace and they use it to justify sin. So very simply, what they do is they want to sin. They want to do whatever their desires are, whatever their flesh desires. And one of the ways they do this, as you see at the end of the verse, he says, they even deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So they do not follow Jesus as their Lord. The very, very simply, they profess to be Christians, but they live like pagans. It's a very serious thing that Jude is dealing with because the issue here is 
what gets compromised if these people gain control, if these people gain influence in the church? What happens is the word of God gets compromised, truth gets diluted, and essentially, essentially the gospel is annihilated. Have a look at verse 3. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So we have this thing called the faith. The faith is that body of truth, that body of truth about Jesus Christ, about salvation. It's been handed down. It was revealed already to the apostles of Christ. And he's saying, you know what? That is in jeopardy of being lost. If we allow these ungodly people to come in and continue the justification of sin, allow the false teaching to propagate throughout the churches, if you allow that to happen, we're actually not going to have a gospel. We're actually not going to have a truth to proclaim anymore. So it's a very, very serious thing. And he basically goes on to talk about the whole, this whole letter is, is exposing these false teachers, exposing these, what I like to call Christian pretenders, Christian pretenders. Now, the people he's writing to are not really the Christian pretenders. He, he's writing to people that he refers to as the called. Look at verse 1. To those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. The called, friends, are people that have experienced the sovereign grace of God in salvation. Where they heard the gospel of Jesus and the Spirit of God convicted them. And they saw their sinfulness. And they were drawn to Christ. Like we were singing now, what, 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 what am I? What am I? What, what do I bring? I bring nothing to the Lord. And they depend totally on Christ for, to be declared righteous. They depend totally on Christ to have their sins forgiven. And they receive that grace. They receive that forgiveness. They receive eternal life. These are the called... And he's impressing upon them a message. And, and what he, when we get to verse 11, he's saying you need to understand something. You need to understand something. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you are one of the called and you have experienced salvation, then this is a message for you. Verse 11 was written for you. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and maybe you are a Christian pretender. Maybe you're aware of that fact. Maybe you're not aware of that fact. But let the word of God sink in, friend. Because the message that Jude has is there is hope for everyone. If you repent of your sin and turn to Christ, he will. He will consider you one of his own. So this is a very sobering message. Um, as we look around the world today, we see that this world is a pretty messed up place. There's so much going on, even this very week, even this very day, even yesterday. There's so much that's going on. Uh, in the Western Cape, they're currently going through a process that's been going on now for over a year of legalizing transgenderism in all the public schools. So what that's going to mean, I'm, I'm a school teacher, what that's going to mean is uh, in all the public schools, uh, they're going to make it law. So, for example, if, uh, if uh, you teach at an all-girls school and there's a boy who believes he's a girl, you cannot deny them access to the school. It includes toilet entry. You cannot deny him access to the toilets. It includes sport. You cannot prohibit him from playing all-girls sport. And uh, I have teacher friends who have already dealt with this issue. It's uh, very much happening in our beloved republic as I speak. Uh, there's also, uh, I saw a few days ago in Zimbabwe, they've just passed legislation there making it illegal for anyone to go to a church and worship God who has not been vaccinated and cannot show proof of vaccination. This is in our neighboring country, Zimbabwe. Uh, in many countries around the world, particularly throughout Europe, they have passed legislation uh, making it a crime to speak against homosexuality. 
They call it homophobia, and it is part of hate speech. I saw a video a few months ago of a faithful pastor who has preached on street preaching in the city of London throughout his life. In his late 70s, he was preaching from Romans 1. Uh, some citizens complained, called the cops, and the cops came. And it was all filmed on video. This man was violently arrested for preaching Romans 1 in the economically advanced country of Great Britain. Friends, this is the country, I mean, this is the world we are living in right now. There is tremendous pressure to follow the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist, the, uh, the world system, the philosophy of our age, it influences all of us to, to one degree or another. We can't escape it because we are living in this world. But we as believers in Christ are being called through this letter of Jude to develop discernment, to be discerning, uh, not just about what's going on outside the church, but to even consider what is happening inside of the church, to be able to distinguish even between those who are merely professing faith in Christ but are not truly born again and those who have actually been called. It's actually a very important thing because as the Word of God makes clear, those who are pretenders will have to propagate false teaching to justify their sinful lifestyles. And in order to do that, they will um, have to silence the gospel. Because the gospel exposes sin. The gospel reveals that I am unworthy to come into God's presence without God's grace. The gospel pushes you to complete, absolute surrender to Jesus Christ. And it's through faith alone that you can be justified. So there has to be a suppression of the gospel if uh, you want to live in sin. And unfortunately, that is happening in many churches around the world today as we see it. I can give you many examples. But what's at stake here is actually the issue of eternal life, isn't it? Just to remind you of Romans 1.16, where the Apostle Paul said that, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. What is the power of God unto salvation? All right? It's not the magic worship team. It's not the magic building. It's not the location. It's none of the, 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 the other things as, as significant as they can be. It's just the gospel. We can never lose the gospel, can we? Otherwise, we're losing the power of God unto salvation. And that's what we have to maintain. The, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me give you a bit of history here. Jude is the man who writes this letter. It's written in the latter half of the first century. All right? Now by this time, there'd been much persecution of Christianity, much persecution of the Christian church. Many Christians had lost their lives for being Christians. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of similarity between Jude and 2 Peter. If you read the description there of these false teachers, of Christian pretenders, it's very, very similar. But we notice there is a distinction. The distinction is, if you read 2 Peter, he speaks about false teachers that are yet to come. He talks about coming false teachers. And then when you read Jude, you read about false teachers that are present. So they, they are current false teachers. So clearly Jude is written after 2 Peter. But I want you to quickly turn to 2 Peter because I think this is very relevant to our discussion this morning. We see in uh, 2 Peter that Peter, he knew he was going to die. In fact, it's highly likely he was sitting in a prison cell waiting his execution when he writes this letter. So this is probably his last will and testament, friends. This is a, the, the last thing he leaves on earth is Second Peter. Now that is very sobering. And let's read <clears throat> what he says in chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. This is him conveying the idea that he, he's about to die. He says, I consider it right 
as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, so as long as I'm, I'm in this body of mine, to stir you up. I want to stir you up, he says, by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. I'm, I'm, soon, to be, I'm soon to be killed. As also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. And what he's saying is, this is my last, the last thing I can say to you is I want to stir you up. And friends, that's what God wants to do to you today. He wants to stir you up. You say, stir me up for what? Stir me up how? Have a look at chapter 2. And here he gets to the purpose of his letter, and this is what he says. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. He's saying, I know what's going to happen. At J. Bay Bible Church, there's going to be false teachers. They're going to come in here. They will come. He knows it. He's had to deal with this many times in his ministry. And this is what he says. Who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And so he's preparing them. Be ready, be on guard, watch out, be discerning. These Christian pretenders are going to come in. They're going to wax eloquent. They will have the gift of the gab. They will have all fancy philosophical terminology. Whatever it is they're going to do, don't be swept away by their false teaching. You say, what does this have to do with Jude, um, well, just consider this, friends. Peter here is about to die, all right? And I want you to look at this prophecy about his death in the Gospel of John. We read of it in John chapter 21. These are the final words of Christ to the apostle Peter, and listen to what Jesus says to him in John chapter 21, verse 18. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. What John is telling us is, Jesus told him, Peter, you are going to have your hands stretched out. And you are going to be crucified. You're going to die the same way I died. That's what he's saying to him. And you must read the end of the verse. He says, the death he would, uh, sorry, what kind of death he would glorify God. Peter is about to glorify God. And you know what tradition tells us? That when they took him to, to crucify him, he said to them, I'm not worthy to be crucified like the Lord. You cannot crucify me this way up. And they ended up, turning him upside down and crucifying him upside down, friends. You say, why do I share that with you? There's something he understands about God, about his Savior, Jesus Christ, and about the core message of the gospel that he can face death in a way that brings glory to God, friend. He lived a life in a way that brought glory to God, and he died in a way that brought glory to God. And when we go to Jude, Peter's already died. 
They've all heard how he died. The apostle is dead. Jude is writing later on. I think he's writing after the Neronic persecution. Nero, who's considered to be, by many historians, one of the most evil men in the pages of history. That's what, who was the, the emperor at the time when Peter was killed. I think Jude is writing after that. And he's basically saying the same thing. Now, the, the thing about Jude is just absolutely fascinating. If you look at Acts chapter 1, we read about the fact that this man was amongst the disciples of Christ. In, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, these all with one mind were continually, continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, you notice, with his brothers. By this stage, which is after the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ, the disciples are waiting for the coming Holy Spirit. Jude is among them. He was one of the stepbrothers of Christ. But what is interesting to know, if you turn back to John chapter 7, is throughout Christ's life, including his ministry, Jude did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. He did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. We read this in John chapter 7 verse 5, for not even his brothers were believing in him. Do you understand what that means, friends? He grew up, his oldest brother never sinned. He never once in his life saw his brother be selfish. He never once saw his brother curse or get sinfully angry or disobey his parents. He never witnessed his eldest brother ever sin. I don't know how he dealt with that, but when his brother started preaching and healing and casting out demons, he did not believe who he was. There was a hatred towards his brother, a resentment towards his brother. And Jesus died on the cross and he still didn't believe and Jesus rose again. And then we read about this appearing that Jesus had to his other brother, James. And then obviously somewhere along the line, Jude is then faced with the reality of who his brother was and he believes in Christ. Now, now, now just go to the letter of Jude, friend, and read verse 1. This is just incredible. He says here, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. He doesn't talk about his human connection to Jesus. He doesn't mention that he is the, the stepbrother of Jesus. He doesn't mention that. He says, I'm the brother of James. But how does he talk about his relationship to Jesus? He says, I am a bond servant of Jesus, which simply means a slave. That's who I am. I, I have experienced the almighty power of God. He's come and he's shown me, look at verse 2. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Let the mercy of God touch your heart today. Let the peace of God that you experience when you've been forgiven and you know what it is to be reconciled with the Lord and, and that love of God that, that holds you in His hand, that, that just the amazing love of God, he, He's experienced that. Friend, this is a changed man. This is a man who has, has believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to Christians who are in grave danger because they have Christian pretenders in their midst. And he knows full well that if you're going to live for Christ, you may die for Christ as well. Peter died. Jude was going to die. The question is, how was he going to die? And you know, I, I just want us to think about this for a moment in time because um, it's very sobering. And in Philippians 
chapter 1, the apostle gives us a perspective about death and, and life. And listen to what he says. This is a, a verse that's familiar to you. In verse 21, he says, For me, to live is Christ. That's it. You look at my life, one thing is going to stand out to you. Uh, it's going to be Jesus Christ. And to die is gain. There's only one better thing to me than living for Jesus, and that is dying, because then I get to be with him face to face. Now, earlier this week, I watched the full session of the British Parliament. They had a session to debate the debacle in Afghanistan. And I don't know if you've ever witnessed the British Parliament, all the members of the House come, and everyone has the right to speak there. And one of the honorable members of the House stood up and appealed to the Prime Minister and asked him for assurance that the 260 missionaries that they know of, British citizens that are trapped in Afghanistan and cannot get to the airport, they wanted the Prime Minister's assurance that everything humanly possible would be done to get those missionaries out of Afghanistan. And of course, the Prime Minister assured that every effort will be made. And I got a report yesterday morning that they had stopped evacuating civilian, British civilians out of Afghanistan, that indeed the airport was closed, and even by last night, the official report came out that all British soldiers had left Afghanistan. Friends, I'm telling you now that those 260 missionaries are in Afghanistan as we speak. And what that means for them is that their death is imminent. Jihadis will find them, and they will execute them. The question they will face now, except for the providential mercy of God, and God can obviously work in amazing ways to keep them alive, but the question is, how are they going to die? How are they going to die? Are they going to die in a way that brings glory to God? You see, think of that legacy. What legacy are they going to leave behind? They're going to die for Jesus, friend. They're going to die for Jesus. That's what's going to happen to them. I'm telling you now. It's actually amazing, isn't it? We go to Jude 11 now, and we, we look at our text. Um, this is how it begins. Woe to them. This is very strong language, friends. Woe, the word woe is an imprecation of doom. What is that? It's, it's a curse. Jude is speaking out a curse upon these people. He actually cannot say this any stronger. Woe to them. That, you know, Jesus used the same language of a particular kind of people. Not, not all unbelievers. The Pharisees. Those people that supposedly spoke for God. But what did they do? They twisted the Bible. They perverted the truth of God. They were false teachers to the max, and they were leading God's people astray. And Jesus said, woe to them, to the, the Pharisees. And here Judas saying, woe to these uh, Christian pretenders. Very, very strong language. And he gives three reasons in this verse why he pronounces a woe upon them. I'll just, just go through the first two very quickly, and then we're going to focus on the third one. So he says, therefore, they have gone the way of Cain. And uh, it's very interesting. He actually mentions three Old Testament examples, three Old Testament illustrations. He doesn't explain them very much because, obviously, these people he's writing to were familiar with the Old Testament. They knew these stories. So the way of Cain is really talking about faithless worship. Then the next one he mentions, um, and so by implication, these Christian pretenders were faithless in their worship. 
The next one he says, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the era of Balaam. Right, so Balaam was a false prophet in the Old Testament. In fact, he was a sorcerer. He would commune with demons, to be quite frank with you. He was involved in black magic. And um, God miraculously intervened so he wouldn't curse Israel. But he did finally overcome that and he was rewarded handsomely by King Balak because he told Balak how to bring a stumbling block upon the people of Israel, which was to entice them into sexual immorality and idolatry, which he did. And many Israelites died as a result of a plague. And by the way, when the, when the Israelites did come in and take over the land, the first thing they did was they went and got Balaam and they executed him for the sin that he had done. But the thing is, he did that all for money. And so by implication, what Jude is saying is that these Christian pretenders are doing this Christian thing for cash. Somehow they're benefiting from it. They're like, I'm Mr. Christian businessman, or I'm, they were wheeling and dealing, or they were somehow profiting from this whole Christian persona that they were giving off. We don't know exactly the details, but that's exactly what he's saying. Woe to them because of their faulty worship. Woe to them because they're in it for the money. And then woe to them for this third reason, and that gets right to our point this morning. He says there, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now that's a bit confusing because this is written in the past tense. How can these people that are presently alive have perished in the rebellion of Korah? The rebellion of Korah happened at least 1,400 years before Jude was written. And this is very significant, friends. He's, he's writing in the past tense on purpose. He's doing it to emphasize the certainty of the fact that God will judge them for their sin. So in other words, when he says here, and perished in the rebellion of Korah, this rebellion of Korah, we will go and look at number 16 and read all about it, okay? The rebellion of Korah, what it is. But basically, his whole point is that these Christian pretenders are rebelling. They're in the process of rebelling. They are rebels. And he says they have perished in a way to emphasize the fact that there's absolute certainty that God will bring them to justice. So it's a judgment that is future but it's so short to happen that he writes it in the past tense. What is this rebellion exactly? The word rebellion means hostility. It means speaking against someone. So they were speaking against um, certain people. You say, who were they speaking against? Well, if you go and look at Korah's rebellion, which we're going to do in a moment, they spoke against the leaders of Israel, i.e. Moses and Aaron. So the implication is these Christian pretenders were in rebellion against the, those men who were shepherding the churches. They were in rebellion against the pastors, against the elders. They were rebelling against them, speaking against them, hostile against them. And probably the best thing we can do right now is go and look at number 16 and read that passage because in that passage we will see the heart behind the rebellion and the process of the rebellion and what happened and how God dealt with them, all that stuff. So numbers 16, number 16, we will work our way through this, this narrative. You may be familiar with the story. You may not be familiar with the story. It takes place, obviously, after Israel had been delivered by God out of Egypt. Um, they had witnessed many miracles, many signs. Moses was their leader. His brother Aaron was helping him. You remember Aaron was um, in charge of the priests, the Aaron line. Aaron and his sons were the priests and his his family line were to be the priests in the nation. Anyways, you have a lot of grumbling going on in the wilderness, and one of them was led by a guy called Korah. So let's read it, uh, work our way through this text. In, in verses 1 and 2, we see that this man Korah led this rebellion, and he managed to get 250 guys together. 
in a group and go and confront Moses and Aaron. Listen to it. Now Korah, the son of Ezar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation chosen in the assembly, men of renown. Okay, so these are, this is not small fry. These are, these are men of renown, significant leaders within the nation. And they go and they state their grievance to Moses and Aaron in verse 3. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Right, so what are they saying here? Basically, <laughs> they're saying, listen, everyone's holy here. Now you guys, you, 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 you're acting like the top dogs. You're acting like we must just do whatever you say, but, but who do you think you are? That's basically what they're saying. And, and look at how Moses responds. He, he responds with incredible humility in verse 4. When Moses heard this, he fell on his face. And that's actually the posture of prayer. Moses goes straight down and starts praying to God. Now, I don't know how long he prayed for, but when he comes up, he then addresses the rebels. And look at what he says in verses 5 to 7. And he spoke to Korah and he, all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Do this. Take senses for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. All right, so he deals with their official charge. Um, basically, these guys were jealous of Moses and Aaron, and he tells them what they're going to do. Come tomorrow, bring your censers with you. So a censer is basically a container in which you burn incense. Okay, so bring your containers with Bring your incense with, we're going to burn it, and the Lord is going to reveal who he has chosen. Right? It's an amazing thing. These guys comply. They, they do exactly what he says. They actually believe, think about this, despite all the evidence that God has shown that Moses is his appointed man, the miracles he's done, right? Parting the red, all that stuff. They believe in their heart that God's going to choose them. It's an incredible thing, this pride. The, the, the prideful person becomes delusional. And that's what we see with these particular men. Well, um, the following verses, verse 8 to 10, Moses gets to their motivation. And this is very interesting. Here we see the heart behind their rebellion, verses 8 to 10. Then Moses said to Korah, Here now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he has brought you near, Korah, and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you? What is he saying? He's saying, you guys are Levites. And the Levites had been uh, given the task of serving the tabernacle, a tremendous privileged form of ministry. They would serve the people that way. But the point, friends, is they didn't want to serve the people. They wanted to boss the people around. Right? They wanted to tell the people what to do, not serve the people. And so we carry on. In verse 10, he says, and are you seeking for the priesthood also? You see, these guys weren't priests. The priests were only Aaron and his family. But they wanted a different position. They wanted what they thought was a higher position. All right? 
And so that is essentially what they are complaining about. And then Moses states the conclusion of the matter in verse 11. Very important verse. Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? <laughs> you know, maybe this is a bit of sibling rivalry here. Like, like who's Aaron that you grumble against? He's just a guy, all right? But that's not really the issue. The, the real issue is this. When they grumbled against Aaron and Moses, they weren't actually grumbling against Aaron and Moses. Who were they grumbling against? Who called Aaron and Moses to their post? Almighty God did. This was a divine appointment. So in essence, they were grumbling against the Lord. They had issue with Yahweh. It changes the whole thing, doesn't it? It's an incredible thing, friends. When You know, we can go through in unbelievable suffering in life, can't we? Uh, stab, getting stabbed in the back, uh, being betrayed, being lied to, being cheated. Many, 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 many terrible things can happen to us in life. And it's very easy to look at others who those things haven't happened to and say, but Lord, this is not fair. Well, of course it's not fair, but friends, how do you deal with this stuff? You know, you have to learn the secret. Would you like to know what the secret is? The Apostle Paul knew what the secret was. And he told us what the secret was in Philippians chapter 4. This is what he says in Philippians 4 verse 11 to 13. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Whatever circumstances, I've learned to be content. And he was writing this from jail, by the way. I know how to get along with humble means. Take away my stuff. I know how to do that. And I also know how to live in prosperity. Give me the Mercedes Benz. I know how to do that. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. I can go eat B Big Macs all day or I cannot eat anything. For days on end, while shipwrecked out in the ocean, I know the secret, friend, both of having abundance and suffering need. You say, what? What is the secret? What is the secret? I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. That's that dependence on Christ. That's that dependence on Christ. My daughter looked at me this morning and said, Daddy, why are you crying? I can't sing about the Lord without crying. I just can't, friend. He just means everything. He's everything, isn't he? It's such a privilege. And here are these men. They, they had everything. They had families. They had tents. They had a privileged position serving the nation. And they're not happy. They, you can't please these people. It's incredible. It's like looking at beggars in America. They're Nike Airs. It's like, hey, man, you've got to come to Africa. <laughs> uh, so they weren't happy. Anyways, let's go back to number 16, all right? And we in uh, verses 12 to 14, there's some other complainers. We have Dathan and Abiram. These are very evil guys as well. So let's read about them in verse 12 to 14. Then Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. They just totally flat out to, uh, defy Moses. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey? Wow, what a description of Egypt. They were slaves, friend. Literal slaves. They called it a, a land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you would also lord it over us. Yeah, you like to flex your muscles, Moses. You, you're the big man. You like to tell everyone what to do. You see how they describe Moses as leadership? They really despised him. And then verse 14, Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Friend, what happened there? They came right up to the land of, 
right up to the land that God had promised them. And they sent out 12 spies. And 10 of those spies came back and said, there's no way we can take out these giants. We, there's no way. And you had Joshua and Caleb saying, of course we can. If God is for us, we can do it. They said, no way. And then God judged them. As many days as those spies went in the land, they were to be judged. They were to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. The reason why they hadn't gone into the land yet wasn't because of Moses' incompetence, Moses' lack of faith. It was because of these men's lack of faith in God. It's incredible how they twisted it, and now they're blaming Moses. And then they say this, um, would you put out the eyes of these men? That's an idiom. Are you going to make these men blind? Are you, you think you can fool everyone? You think you're going to hoodwink us, Moses? We will not come up. So they just blatantly defy Moses, right? So what does Moses do now? Now he has to respond. This is very critical of Moses, and he responds um, in prayer. Uh, it's an amazing thing to learn, your friend. When, when you get lambasted in some way, just take it to the Lord in prayer. When you get dealt with unjustly, in some terrible way, take it to the Lord in prayer. When, when, when you feel that anger welling up inside of you and it's, it's overwhelming you, you've got to go to the Lord in prayer. This is what he does. Look at verse 15. Then Moses became very angry and said to the Lord, Do not regard their offering. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. He had done nothing to hurt anyone, friend. He had taken no tribute from them. He had been a man of integrity a man of honor throughout his leadership. And he prays to God and he says, God, you deal with them, right? Then he speaks to these rebels and look at what he says in verses 16 to 17. Moses said to Korah, you and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you and they along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it and each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. All right, so they must all bring their fire pans and they're all going to put the incense on it and the Lord's going to show who he has chosen to lead the nation. Okay, then the next thing we read in verses 18 to 19 is that Korah gathers along with Israel. So this is the next day, obviously, and uh, this is what we read in verses 18. Uh, so they each took his own censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it, and they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So they're right by the tabernacle. These are the 250 men with Moses and Aaron. Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Now, now consider this. All of the congregation would be a reference to all of the congregation of Israel. Now it's interesting as he mentions the congregation here because this is the parallel to Jude. Jude is writing to churches, and he's saying, when you've gathered together in your midst, there's some Christian pretenders. And so here we have all of Israel gathering to witness this event. And in a sense, what we read about here in verse 19 is a national rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And then we read the, the second half of verse 19. It tells us that... Um, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregations. So God manifested himself to them, the glory of the Lord. And then verse 20 to 21, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, now listen to this, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. What God wanted to do was destroy the entire nation of Israel at that point because they had completely rebelled against God by rebelling against Moses and Aaron. But once again, Moses intercedes. Verse 22, but they fell on their faces, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and said, oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? They asked that rhetorical question, just appealing to God all right, not to judge everyone, just the rebels, right? And God does comply with that request, verse 23 and 24. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Okay, God's going to be merciful to Israel, but they mustn't be near these rebels because God is going to deal with them, friend. He's going to deal with them. And then at verse 25, 
to 30, Moses goes to Dathan and Abiram. Let's read what happens. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them or you will be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. What he's saying is, if these guys die a natural death, then God didn't send me. They are going to have to die a supernatural death. There's going to be some kind of supernatural, miraculous judgment kind of death. Otherwise, God didn't send me. And then look at the next verse. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. So here he's talking about the ground opening up and swallowing them up. He's using this personification to describe some kind of earthquake that would the ground's just going to open up and they're going to go down and just be covered up by the ground. And then immediately, um, they get judged. Verse 31. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. And their households and all the men who belonged to Korah and their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them. And they perished from amidst, from the midst of the assembly. You see that? That actually happened. Now, what would you do, friend, if you were there and you saw that? You witnessed such a thing. Verse 34, all Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, the earth may swallow us up. They're in absolute fear. They just witnessed the very judgment of God against rebellion. And then just to take it back to Jude for a moment, think about this. You know, Jude is saying, God is going to judge these Christian pretenders. It's, it's absolutely certain but leave it in the Lord's hands. You know, and just to remind you of verse 30 there, um, <laughs> these people had spurned the Lord. That's who they spurned. You see, Moses didn't have to take it personally. It wasn't actually personal. They were actually spurning the Lord, right? So, it's very sad. Then in verse 35, we read about the 250 men, which is Korah, and his followers who were still at the tabernacle at the time, they get judged by God also in a supernatural way. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. This is similar to Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't it? Fire from heaven. It came down and fried these guys. In an instant, they died. Very graphic. Very, very, very graphic. Now, I want to show you something that should blow your mind. It's actually remarkable in Numbers 26. This is a commentary on what happened earlier in Numbers 16. Look at what we are told in Numbers 26, verses 9 to 11. The sons of Eliab, Nemuel, and Dathan and Abiram, these are the Dathan and Abiram who were called by the congregation who contended against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah when they contended against the Lord. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up along with Korah when that company died, when the fire devoured 250 men so that they became a warning. These guys were a warning to the rest of the people. Now notice verse 11 of Numbers 26. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. 
And you say, okay, what's the big deal there? Well, you remember the sons of uh, those other guys, Dathan and Abiram, they did die. Their whole families died with them. But the sons of Korah didn't die. And, and, and this is screaming of God's grace, friends. It's screaming of God's grace. Korah's offspring never followed their father's rebellion. And I wanted to show you a couple of psalms. These guys grew up, and you know what they did? They wrote many of the psalms. These guys became musicians and led the people of God in worship. Korah's offspring, think about it. I'll just mention two, for, for example. Psalm 42, it says, A maskil of the sons of Korah. Psalm 44, A maskil of the sons of Korah, a song of love. Let's think about the gospel for a second. You know, God is so gracious to us, isn't he? That no matter what we've done in this world, we can turn to him in faith and he will forgive us. That's what he wants to do, friend. He commands us to repent of our sin, just to admit it, confess it, and turn away from it. And place all of our trust in his beloved son, Jesus Christ. And then he promises to Receive us as his own. That's the wonderful truth of the gospel. So Jude's whole point here is uh, God's woe is upon these Christian pretenders because they are rebelling against God's authority in the local church. That's talking about elders and pastors. So let's, as we close, just think about some implications for us today. All right? Some implications of the sin of rebellion against spiritual authority in the local church. There's just three things I want to say. Um, the first one is the Bible calls those in spiritual authority pastors. Uh, same men are called elders. Same men are called overseers. All right? Terms are interchangeable. Number two, the primary function of these men in the local church is to watch over the souls of the sheep. Uh, we read about that in Hebrews 13 verse 17 it's really worth looking at this verse right this is their primary function it can in a sense sum up what they do hebrews 13 17 obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account let them do this with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you so there's their job is soul care soul care very, very um, significant task. And then number three is this. The sheep should honor these men. That's what they should do. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You say, how should they honor them? Well, there's two ways you can honor your pastors. One way we read in verse 12 it says, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. So one thing you can do is really appreciate them. Really appreciate them. You know, it's hard work. Um, the burden of ministry never leaves you. You can go on holiday. You can have a day off. <laughs> if you're an elder, you know a whole bunch of stuff of what's going on in people's lives. And that just never leaves you, friend. Um, they have charge over you in the Lord. They give you instruction. These men are always studying the Bible because they're counseling, they're discipling, they're teaching Bible studies, they're preaching. They're always in the book all the time. And that's hard work. Appreciate them for what they do. And what's another thing you can do? How else can you esteem your pastors? Look at verse 13. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Esteem them very highly in love. All right? Your pastors are more important in your life than your president. Believe it or not. Or Winguru. 
right? They're watching over your souls. The question is, how do you do this? Well, pray for them. Pray that the Lord gives them wisdom. Pray that the Lord gives them boldness to stick to the truth. Encourage them in their labors. Thank them maybe sometime. Thank them for what they do. Um, don't seek their position so you can have control over the local church. All right? Don't seek their position. You look around the world today, there's enough control freaks out there, okay? Don't add your name to the list, friend. All right? But what if you disagree about a decision they make? All right? You're not going to always agree with everything that the elders decide, and, and you're very blessed here to be part of a church where there's an elder board, a group of men. And, and one of the blessings of that is you have a collective wisdom that comes into place. But if you disagree, you just need to think about the issue for a little bit, and maybe I can give you some advice here. Uh, distinguish whether the issue is about form or function. So form and function is a big thing. Function are the things that we're commanded to do in the church. For example, we must preach because we're commanded to preach the Word of God. Uh, the form would be, well, how do you preach? How long do you preach? Where do you preach from? I'll give you an example we command it to sing to one another in the church, right? Well, yes, okay, but the form would be, okay, well, what style of music are we going to use? What instruments are we going to use? Are we even going to have instruments? See, that's all form. Does it make sense? So if it's a form issue, that's very different to a function issue. Also, distinguish whether the issue you have a problem with is, is, is prescriptive, if it's the Word of God's commanded it, or it's a preference issue. Right? For example, if the elders decide, you know what, we're going to paint the church beige. But you think it's got to be green, all right? It's, it has to be green. Uh, friends, that is a preference issue. Um, maybe you're right, it should be green, but most of the time you don't want to spill your milk over formal preference issues, really. Okay? Uh, choose the hills you want to die on, all right? There's a chance you may die for Christ. We have brothers and sisters who are dying right now for Christ. But they die on the, choose down the right hill, all right? Not, not the color of the paint. Um, if, but if you still really feel strongly, whatever the issue is, there's nothing wrong about that. You go and you speak to the elders. You can do that, right? I'm sure there's various means and, and platforms you can do that. But do it, do it privately. Go, this is the key, go as a peacemaker. That, that's the mindset, a peacemaker. You can speak to an elder individually. I don't know what the protocols are here, but uh, maybe you have access to the elders' meetings. I don't know, but you can go speak to an elder or maybe several elders and uh, call a meeting and ex express your things and discuss it, have dialogue. That's very important, but, but a, a very wrong way to do it is to stand up in a public forum and bring your complaint in that context. Uh, straight away, it is divisive. It's unnecessarily divisive. And that's not what you want. You don't want to be that Cora kind of guy. All right? Um, and remember this, friend. Elders are, smell like sheep. Elders that are, are worth anything smell like sheep. They know what's going on in people's lives. And, 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 and unfortunately, sometimes they know about a lot of evil things that are going on that you don't necessarily know about and and that's a good thing that you don't know so they, they they often have more knowledge and facts than you do about the entire congregation and that's one thing to keep in mind another one is that there's a group of men and there's a collective wisdom that comes together there's men from different backgrounds they collectively pool they collectively pray they collectively discuss the word of god when it comes to oversight and that is a real blessing to the church. So it behooves you just to honor that as uh, in a way that brings glory to God. Um, we are busy living through a fascinating time of history with uh, the China virus, uh, COVID-19. Uh, sorry, a bit of tongue-in-cheek there. Um, and all kinds of regulations and stipulations and and. You know, people coming up with stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> to be an elder during these days is, 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 is challenging because there's 
like what do you do you know do do we conform to the regulation do we not and how do we enforce this or do we enforce it or do we not enforce it and there are some real tensions there and, and, and it's it's not easy so we must pray for our shepherds friends we must pray for them that god would lead them and that we would be patient that we would not be a source of disunity that we would encourage unity but uh, we would be faithful to proclaim the gospel of christ as well all right so let me just close with a, a quick word about jude this man was an old man when he wrote this book. He was a faithful slave of Christ. He died sometime. We don't know about his death, but he had children and he had grandchildren. And what we do know about is his grandchildren because the historian Eusebius writes about his grandchildren. And there was an emperor by the name of Domitian who ran the world at the end of the first century. The apostle John was exiled to Patmos under Domitian's reign, and he died there as a result of Domitian. Well, one day, Jude's grandchildren stood before the emperor of Rome, Domitian, and faithfully testified of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, that is a testimony of Jude's legacy. They probably grew up saying, you know, my grandfather? Let me tell you about my grandfather. And when the day came, they did the same thing. Friends, let's pray that God will give us the same legacy.